Hey guys, all right, so I'm just gonna go through a bit of background on me. Then I'm gonna talk about what I've learned doing my most recent startup and how we expanded that internationally. And I'm also gonna go through, um, based off what I've learned and what I've seen with other friends have done kind of international startups, what you should be looking at, what the challenges are, and you know what we all learned on the, in the trenches kind of trying to overcome them. Yeah, so as Shway mentioned, uh, in 2008, while I was studying here at Melbourne Uni, myself and three friends got together and did my first startup. It was called Soak. There's a screenshot of our software up here. It was like a farm management system. We went in the Imagine Cup, which is Bill Gates' uh, software design competition, and we came first out of 220,000 students in the world. Got to go to Paris, got to meet Bill Gates, got to uh, grant money. Uh, tried to turn this into a business, but the global financial crisis hit. Suddenly all these people that were willing to write us a check uh, went quiet and closed their wallets and uh, so that startup ended up dying. So I took a job at ANZ Bank and uh, helped them make the ANZ Go Money iPhone app. Uh, we took it to New Zealand but given it was a big company the international expansion wasn't that hard. Uh, next I joined a really cool startup uh, that I'm pretty proud of in Melbourne called Rome to Rio. So these guys do like Google Maps, but on steroids. So how to get from A to B using train, bus, ferry, walking, pretty any, any type of transport. So I could be here right now and say, I want to get to the Louvre in Paris. And it will literally say, jump on the tram, get on the other tram and get the sky bus, uh, go catch a flight to Amsterdam, get a train to Paris and then get this bus to the Louvre. And it'll look at every single combination and give you guys uh, the best the best couple in terms of price or journey time. These guys have done a really, really good job of expanding internationally. So they've got multi-language support, they've got millions of users from all around the world, and they're running it all out of Melbourne in a very lean way. So I'm definitely gonna reference uh, some of the good stuff these guys taught me. Yeah, after that, I went to the US and did the Silicon Valley thing and uh, studied and kind of got a feel for all this exciting stuff that was going on in California. Um, came back and wanted to do my own startup I uh, did that with two friends and yeah, it was Shway mentioned we're in the very first map batch. That was our first day in the original map office and you can see there's plastic on the chairs and it's not very startup-y but we, we ended up making it pretty fun. Okay, so the first startup I did originally started out as a personalized radio app. Then we pivoted and we became a kind of text-to-speech reader where we'd get articles from all around the world and make it so people could hear them. Then eventually, after two years of trying all this different stuff, we finally found our footing. We became a, an on-demand audio platform. So essentially what we do is radio stations or podcasters, so people are making audio, think Hamish and Andy. Our platform would basically capture their audio, do all the editing, put it all over the internet so people could listen to it. We'd bring back all the analytics. We'd let people pay money. We'd let people put in ads. And before they were using all these different tools to do all of that. And so we started out in Australia. Uh, in Australia, uh, radio landscape, there's like a couple of big networks that kind of have all the market share. Then there's this long tail of really small stations. And so what we found was that these big enterprise clients was where all the money was. And, you know, you could do one deal and get, you know, like 100 stations rather than going after this long tail. So after the big deals here dried up, we're like, wow, we really need to expand internationally. So from there we, um, yeah, we spent a couple of years, as I mentioned, trying, and uh, eventually we were able to land quite a few clients. Um, so these guys are in the US, uh, these guys are in the UK, those guys are in Dublin, um, the guys in the bottom are in London, in styles kind of all around the world. And so, um, yeah, at first it was like hitting a brick wall, but then after kind of learning a lot of trial and error, a lot of speaking to people, we're definitely able to break down those barriers in what is a very, I guess, traditional, slow-moving industry. So um, before I get into kind of what we did to get those customers, I just want to, I guess, set the tone that you've got to really ask yourself before you go into this, do you actually want to expand internationally? So um, we had competitors that were doing what we're doing. They're in Australia. Just by focusing on Australia, they would be able to iterate faster than us. And we then started playing this game of, all right, we're going to get other customers overseas. 
that's going to slow us down because there's all these challenges I'm about to talk about. But we believe that for us, that's going to be the right thing to do in the, in the long term. And so you really need to go based off what your product is, what your vision is, where you want to go. Is this the right thing for you? And there's literally all these different markets to expand to. There's all these different ways to do it. So there is no kind of silver bullet. Literally, the answer is um, it depends and you need to do what works for you. Okay, so the first thing we did was identify where we wanted to expand to. So a lot of businesses uh, in Australia start off going, okay, we've got Australia, the lad New Zealand. It's pretty, um, you know, it's really close. There's a lot of kind of, uh, a lot of people that have kind of worked in both. And a lot of it's, it's pretty easy to kind of uh, jump into that market, especially with the timing and, and how close it is. Next logical steps are usually the US or the UK. So these are both very big markets. It's extremely easy to get a visa if, um, if, if you can work in Australia. Uh, so we, we set our sights on those. Then uh, once, we, once we got the kind of, uh, I guess, UK and, and US markets, uh, we went after more European markets, uh, starting with the low hanging fruit like uh, Germany. So most, pretty much everyone in Germany speaks English, so we didn't actually have to like localize our products or, um, or kind of do many changes. There was not much resistance from all the customers. Then we started going for a lot of markets in Asia, so uh, Singapore, Malaysia. Um, then eventually the big markets like India, uh, India and China, we left those last because they're really big, they're really hard to get, you need local partners. Um, and so I'll kind of go into those a bit later. So right, once, you've, once you've picked this market that you want to go into, and try not to pick a few, try to do one at a time. So you've got your startup, you've decided that Australia is not big enough anymore and you're willing to kind of take that risk. Pick your first market and then start kind of testing the water, start marketing. So in terms of online marketing, just putting up kind of surveys or putting up test contents and using Google AdWords and Facebook ads we were able to get all this amazing feedback on our product before we spent any serious time or money doing anything. So just getting traffic to your, you know, your landing page um, with these ads and then seeing if anyone actually signed up um, was a really good way to get started. And that, that started working for us. Um, the next one, uh, content marketing. Has anyone heard of content marketing before? Okay, I'm seeing a few nods. Okay, so content marketing is... is Basically, I'm sure you're all seeing it every day in your Facebook newsfeed and um, all over blogs and on Twitter and that kind of stuff. Basically, it's you write content that your audience would find incredibly valuable or useful, and then you get it in front of them. And then after they find that content really useful and it helps them, you can kind of build a relationship with them. So you want them reading a couple of your kind of articles that you produce, then you want to capture their email. Once you've got the email, you want to get them actually going to your page and, and looking at your product. Eventually, you want to get them to do a demo, and then you, you kind of drip feed them all the way along. And so we, we found that the content marketing, um, applying that to different markets worked really, really well. Uh, so here's an example for my, I guess, radio business. So we, we had all these radio stations. We wanted to get podcasters. We started writing all these articles like, what is, what's the best way to share audio? And um, if you want to get, if you want to interview someone on your podcast, how do you do that remotely? And there's, you know, there's all these, um, there are all these posts all over the internet. Like, do you use Skype or can you use your phone and record it somehow? And so we basically would write these articles and then we'd syndicate them all over the internet to all these platforms that were useful for the markets we were going for. So this is pretty, I guess, English speaking, just like top primary markets. But we definitely looked at some different ones in Russia, um, some different ones uh, for Japan, uh, that kind of stuff. But yeah, this is an incredibly valuable way to kind of really build up a following and it, it works well for other markets. And so these articles that um, we'd get done, you could translate them if you're going after multi-language and then kind of tweak them a bit. A really good one that uh, helped a ton was conferences. So. There, there, there definitely is conference overload, like just for the radio industry, which we were targeting, there are literally conferences all around the world all the time. We're always getting asked like, hey, would you like to come and sponsor the conference? Hey, would you like to come and you know, get a booth or do a demo, this kind of stuff? What I've found is getting an expo booth, unless you spend a ton of money, doesn't usually give you that much uh, traction. 
what you really want to do is be featured in one of the talks. And we found that by doing all these content marketing posts, people started seeing our company as a thought leader company. And then we started getting invited to the conferences by the organizers. So there's one here where I couldn't go, but they were willing to let me Skype in remotely. So I didn't really have any costs aside from just jumping on Skype and spending a bit of my time to get in front of this massive radio conference in Europe. Um, this is another guy who was one of our company advisors who was asked to speak at the conference and then he, he put in some slides about us. You don't have to be the one that, that goes and talks. If you're just kind of creating a lot of buzz or you're doing some really good stuff, getting other people to cover you that are third parties like looks even better. Um, yeah, what we found is we went to one or two conferences where we did get a booth and did spend kind of money on that stuff. One of them worked out really well. The other didn't work out well at all. And we decided that the return on investment just wasn't there. So if there is a conference that you think looks really good, see if you can go the year before you expo and take a look. But if, if timings, uh, if you want to move really fast, you can't wait that long. Usually the old conference websites will be up or if you go and speak to the conference organizer, you can say, hey, who was someone who, who are a couple of people who are at this conference last year, I can speak to and I can find out how their experience was. And that way you can kind of filter it because if you do get the right conference and you get the booth and you have the people, it can be really, really good. So for us, our, what we found was in Europe, there was this one radio conference that pretty much the whole world aside from America goes to. And so we went to that and hit it hard and we got more leads in two days than we'd gotten in like the previous year. Whereas we had other conferences in the US where we paid tons of money and we literally got no return on investment. Um, a really good one that um, has helped us a ton is channel partnerships. So we found with these, these old radio stations, we'd go in and we'd say, hey, we've got this great software. It's gonna you know, make your life really, really easy. All these people are using it. If, um, if it was someone who wasn't in their market, often they'd say, hey, why don't you have um, an Italian example or a French example or this? And it was really, really hard to always get that first kind of client. Then once we actually had a client in their market and we started speaking to them, it still took ages to actually build the relationship for, with them and for them to trust us and that kind of stuff. So what we found is we looked for uh, products that would have some kind of integration with our platform where they could complement each other. And then we made friends with these companies and we said, hey, if you get your product, it plugs into our product and it's better for the customer. What if we let you guys resell our product and we'll give you a revenue share on that? Then suddenly these guys who would look after, you know, just Sweden or just the UK or just Italy would be incentivized to get all their customers who have trusted them for years and then upsell our product. And especially when they sold us an add-on for something that's already in the radio station, suddenly we were getting all these intros, we were getting all this work done. We literally just had to kind of sit back while these champions we picked in different markets kind of did the selling for us. So I strongly recommend um, investigating channel partnerships. A lot of people are gonna push for exclusivity. I've seen people get burnt this way. You let someone be your kind of channel partner exclusively for that market. If they don't perform, you're stuck and it really kind of holds you back. So try to avoid exclusivity. On the flip side, if it's a market that you don't really care about or you don't want to go into that badly, then there's nothing wrong with letting someone own it and try it. Um, now, uh, joint, joint venture. Uh, so one of the things we looked at was going into China and doing a joint venture. So our radio software for radio stations actually sits in the radio station and records um, what's coming through the mics and all these other things that are going on. In China, that wasn't appropriate for a, a non-local company to kind of come in and be tracking the media because they've got some very different media laws there. So we found a local partner uh, who could operate in the area, who already had a really big business, they already had all the licenses, they knew the government, all that kind of stuff. And so we partnered, we we're gonna partner with them to basically make a joint venture where they owned a majority of it, we provided all the tech, they did all the business, the marketing, the sales, all that kind of stuff. And then rather than having nothing in China, we were able to own kind of a piece of that. Uh, that's generally how a lot of these companies go. So if you look at um, Uber, they ended up kind of pulling out and, and merging with another big Chinese company. A lot of people are criticizing them over that. I think it's pretty smart because they've been able to get a percentage of the biggest player in China that's like supported by the government, which is pretty cool. Um, the other thing I'd say on, on those markets like India and China, it definitely helps if you've got someone in your team or someone you can partner with that knows what they're doing there because it takes a long time to kind of pick up all that, all that, I guess, experience. 
I was really fortunate that one of my co-founders was born in China and had family there and, and kind of knew a lot. Even then, it still took us a lot to kind of over a year to get this joint venture kind of planned. And then in the end, we didn't have enough resources to kind of do that and the rest of the world, and we couldn't go into it, um, which wasn't a, I guess, wasn't a bad thing, just wasn't the right thing for us at the time. Uh, so in terms of government support, uh, I was in San Francisco uh, the last kind of month. The um, Victorian government have got an office in San Francisco. They've also got some in other markets around the world where you can go and they have a team on the ground that will help introduce you to potential clients, potential partners, um, academics doing relevant research. Uh, it's really useful, but it's not a silver bullet. So expect to kind of get point in the right direction on a couple of meetings and maybe find out about a few conferences. They're not going to go out and sell your product for you, though. That's not what they're there for. They're there to kind of help grow the ecosystem. But I'd strongly recommend um, checking that out. They also hold a lot of other programs like they do regular trade missions. So they'll pick a whole group of companies to all go to Singapore or all go to Japan and they'll literally set up, set up relevant meetings for the whole group. Uh, so there's a, I guess, Victorian Department of uh, Trade that looks after all of this and they've got some grants, they've got some other funding. I'd strongly recommend checking it out if you do want to go international. Okay. All right, so um, I just kind of want to go through, I guess, how we found was like the ideal way to kind of enter a new market if you're physically going to kind of travel there. So I went to Singapore in 2012. I'd never been there before. Uh, knew uh, there was a conference and they were willing to like fly me there. So I had them book the tickets. Then I changed the tickets. So I had a week before the conference and a couple of days after the conference. Then I went on LinkedIn and, cert and filtered by Singapore, typed in all the different companies I'd want to see, went and did all this research and was able to suddenly work out, wow, this person I know here knows this other person. Wow, my friend here's moved to Singapore. Like, you know, he knows a couple of other people. And I basically reached out to everyone I could get who was somewhat relevant and then just also did kind of cold emails, um, just tried all these different things and basically set up as many meetings as I could going to the place. I put them literally on the first three days because what you want to do is you want to get there, have tons of meetings. With the meetings, you show up, you have the meeting, you don't make it too long because you want to kind of um, a short and snappy kind of valuable meeting is definitely the way to go. So I'd rarely do over half an hour unless I thought they were like a pretty important player for us. Go have the meeting. At the end, I'd give them a little gift. So on, on Swanson Street, they've got the Australian stores where they sell uh, all the different stuff. Just buy like little kangaroos or koalas. They end up costing like two bucks each. Goes down really well. People give it to their partner or they put it at their desk or they give it to their kids. You'd, you'd be surprised uh, how, how well that's gone. And so you give them a present at the end. You say, you know, you know what? I really appreciated that you were nice enough to meet with me. Please take this. Oh, and if there's anyone else you think I should meet, let me know. And then what happens is they go, oh, you should meet AJ or you should meet Claire. And so these people would kind of introduce me to the next group of people. Then they'd introduce me to the next group of people and I ended up with this thing where it kind of would triangle out. And that's why you need kind of a, at least a few more days there so you can take these kind of follow-up meetings or the people you see that were really good, you can kind of see again. And that way you're not locked, to, um, locked, locked into tons of kind of one-hour meetings like spread throughout the week. So I go to Singapore, I set up all these meetings, I meet some more people, the really good ones that are relevant, I kind of see again. Go to this conference, literally just walk up to people, what brings you to the conference, talking point, and just anyone you speak to, like, looks can be deceiving. Like, you never know who they might be or who they might know. Like, I was in Silicon Valley um, at a conference, oh, it would have been like five years ago. There was this one guy in the room um, and no one was talking to him, so I decided to go up and talk to him. Uh, he was doing this, like, kind of conferencing um, conferencing startup, and I'd used it, and so we had a bit of a chat about it, and then he goes, oh, you know, this is cool, do you want to get lunch tomorrow? I'm like, sure. So this guy bought me lunch, we're talking, I wanted some advice for, you know, how to make my startup good, uh, perform better, and anyway, he kept talking about his first startup, and I was like, all right, what's your first startup? He's like, oh, I co-founded this um, company called LinkedIn, and I was just like, whoa. And so that guy has literally opened all these doors for me over the years, and just is like a kind of A player. And just because he wasn't dressed up and wasn't hustling hard at this conference, like everyone kind of underestimated him or didn't know who he was. He's just kind of a quiet, introvert guy. And so I, I try and, you know, work the room, meet lots of people, be nice to everyone. Um, and just, you know, you never know who you're going to meet or what's going to happen. 
Um, once you've left, uh, it's like literally the day after the conference or even that night before you leave, try and do all the follow-ups because you want people, while it's fresh in their mind, coming back to work. And they want to see kind of a short email of a nice, clear kind of follow-up. And you should always try and leave the meeting with a clear follow-up if that's possible. And so pr pretty much what happened is over, over the Omni journey, we started, we did the UK, then we kind of did America, then eventually Singapore, which unlocked a lot of kind of Southeast Asia, then um, back to Europe and kind of slowly adding like uh, France, Germany, some of those markets, went to Dubai and then unlocked part of the Middle East and just kind of kept rolling, uh, I guess rolling from there. And then I literally ended up to the point where um, our whole team was here and I was running the whole, like all our international sales, relations, big deals and kind of traveling half the year to see all these markets and for us to run without actually having anyone overseas, which is a very interesting experience. Uh, okay, so we picked some markets, we got some customers and we'd gone to some conferences, met some people. The product doesn't always work overseas how you thought it would work in Australia. And that was something we learned really, really fast. And so you definitely need to uh, localize it. Definitely test with the AdWords and just with some international clients to see what they're happy with. So we had tons of clients where they'd ask us for all this stuff. And we'd say, you know, this is coming or, or, or all, that, all that kind of stuff. But then as soon as we made it clear that the, they weren't coming or they weren't like way back on the priority, some of them started using it and actually found that there was enough value there for, for them to use it. So try not to kind of, I guess, promise all this stuff and try and get them using what you've got ready now and to focus on that. And running the AdWords is really good because it forces them to try what you've got up and what you've got available. And so then, um, but then you will find like with China and some of these other markets, there were things we had to do where for legal reasons or just for cultural reasons, you just couldn't kind of do it that way. Um, and so once we, once we did that, we'd start scoring everything. We'd work out, all right, what are the different kind of things that uh, are going to move the needle the most? And we've got all these different markets to focus on. So um, it's kind of a bit of a detour, but does anyone want to talk? Quickly about like product prioritization, like how you'd kind of get over that that problem. Is that interesting to people? Anyone? Yep. Okay. All right. So we'd be sitting in a meeting room. We'd have our like product team. We'd have the salespeople, and everyone would have like the different kind of features they wanted and the different things they were trying to prioritize. So what we do is everyone would write a list uh, during the week of like all the different kind of features they wanted, all the different things we could do. Like let's translate into this language, which had this feature. Then what we do is we'd um, We'd like put them all into a giant kind of list and then we'd give, um, <clears throat> we'd get everyone to kind of go through that. So it's, it's in Excel, it lists all the features. We get every single person in the team to have a column and they have to rank each of the, each of the items. Um, must we have this? Should we have this? Or is it kind of like nice to have? Then we'd assign like a three point, a two point, a one point and we'd kind of go for all of that. Then we'd weight it based off all the different um, people and we'd end up with like a score for each one. Um, then we'd start, then we'd put that in order and we'd start with just the kind of top ones and then we'd start um, talking about them from there and like reprioritizing and do the prioritizing again. And eventually we'd end up with um, this list of like every feature we we're gonna have in priority order. And then you could add other, other things on like, you know, if, it, if it's gonna add more revenue, give it some extra points. If it's gonna bring in X amount of customers, you know, give it this many points. But if you do that, you can start to come up really quickly with which features do people care about in your team and which features are actually going to kind of move the needle. And once we started doing this, we realized that some of these localization features in certain markets just weren't kind of a priority. Um, so, yeah, in terms of localization, uh, one thing that I guess I was surprised by was just how hard it became to look after multi-language. So you've got your, you've got your website, um, you want to have it in a few different languages. There's services where you can go out there and you just pay them some money and they'll translate your site. They'll give you a nice file that you develop and can kind of put in. That meant that suddenly every material change we did, we had to update our documentation, we had to update our website, and it started really slowing us down. If I think back to that kind of example of if there are competitors that are just in Australia, if we're doing like seven languages and they're doing like only one, and they can iterate faster, 
they can start cutting our lunch just for all the English speakers and they might be able to get big enough that they can like really start to become a problem. So you really do need to get that balance between is it actually worth being in this market? Is it actually worth um, you know, doing the localization change or doing the multi-language change? I found that you can definitely shortcut. So a lot of our customers um, had someone in their team that spoke English or that there wasn't that much text in our apps they are able to kind of work it out. Another thing that you can do is you can do training videos in that language, but keep the website and everything else in English, and then they can just kind of use Google Translate or kind of navigate their way around. But yeah, that once again, it comes back to like how difficult your product is and what you need to kind of do. Like some people that it's just a kind of software as a service, you sign up on the spot. Other people need distributors or need to be approved for, you know, uh, like health and safety or all this other stuff. Yeah, so on that, um, now, that, now that you've basically got people using your product and um, they know about it uh, they, and it works in their country, you then need to make sure that they can pay for it and that you can operate there. So international tax can get uh, pretty messy. Um, taking payments can be pretty interesting. So we, we looked at having our prices and all these different kind of currencies because that's what all our um, overseas customers wanted. Problem with that was is the currency value would change and all our costs were in AUD. And so we didn't want to deal with that risk. So we ended up switching most of our costs to um, USD. And then we just had USD for the whole world. And um, we found that not many clients were willing to kind of, I guess, be unhappy about that and kind of walk away. There were definitely some complaints though when there were big currency changes. If we'd had much bigger volumes, then we would have probably offered local currencies and we would have um, put effort into hedging and doing kind of other financial tactics to kind of make the currency um, thing be not a point of issue. But for our scale, it just wasn't worth it. Um, in terms of legal, we didn't, we didn't really have that many, I guess, legal hurdles. We got patents, um, we got trademarks, if anyone is patenting something, you can do an international patent where you get 18 months. And then after that, you can pick which markets you actually want to spend the money in. And so that kind of bought us 18 months. And then we just, by then, we knew which markets were important to us. So we only paid for like the, the top few. Um, with trademarks, it's, it's pretty cheap and same deal. Only get the markets that are like really important to you. Okay, so time zones. Um, this one became quite an issue because of our uh, customer base. So I pretty much started coming to the office at lunchtime, doing Australia in the afternoon, uh, then doing focusing on Asia, then focusing on uh, Europe as they woke up, and then focusing on East Coast America, and then kind of repeating. And um, it was fine from Monday to Thursday, but then when it was a Friday night and kind of everyone, everything was happening and I wanted to go out, that wasn't really possible. And so we ended up with this weird situation where our customers in like New York and California and that kind of, those kind of places on a Friday just wouldn't get an answer because everyone in our office would go home on Friday afternoon. Um, so it wasn't that bad for the first few months, but then there was a big mess up on, on a Friday and luckily I was able to kind of pick it up in my email when I was coming home and we were able to fix it then, but... Having that support kind of around the clock was really, really important. There's actually a startup uh, that some ex-Melbourne Uni guys are involved in that I'm going to chuck a bit of a hello to called Influx. And so what these guys do that's really cool is they put, they get these, I guess, customer support teams and they put them in all these countries around the world. And then you teach them how to do your customer support and they teach people at each one of those centers how to do it. So if you have some big spike suddenly, like you're, you get featured in some magazine or you get featured on the top of Reddit or something and all these people come, they're literally, and your tickets go up, they'll start adding more people so you can reach, you can kind of get, get a response within two hours. And they charge you per ticket, not on having people. So suddenly with a service like this, it didn't matter if it was the weekend, we were still answering tickets and I, myself and the rest of the team didn't have to worry about checking our email when we're out, which is, which is pretty exciting. Um, there's not just kind of customer support uh, services like this. There's like sales. There's all sorts of things you can do um, by pointing people overseas to help you. But I'd recommend having a decent volume. Um, these guys are pretty good though, so you could get them pretty fast. A lot of people also use them for just managing those spikes, even if they don't have international customers. Um, so yeah, what, what I found is um, Australia is pretty good for touching a lot of time zones. 
you definitely can have people in your team um, come to work earlier or come to work later to kind of share that load. Another thing though is you can just set the expectations like, hey, for US clients, we you know we we don't have support during Friday, or you can find someone in the US that is willing just to cover that gap for you and do like an hourly hourly kind of wage. But um, yeah, definitely definitely became a challenge running it all from Australia. Our goal was to kind of get get bigger and get to the point where we can have you know someone for Europe, someone for America, someone for Asia, kind of like handling it all. Uh, yeah, so on that, international offices, um, the general trend uh, would be for kind of APAC to have someone in Sydney that's now moving to Singapore because then you can not just do Australia and New Zealand, but you can also do most of Asia. Uh, Dublin is kind of the go-to for Europe because you don't pay much tax. Also, same with Singapore. And, you know, a lot of big companies have kind of set up there. There's a whole department um, in Singapore and uh, in Ireland as well that literally just help your company set up an office there and leverage all these different grants and all these different opportunities. Um, London's pretty good for Europe. Um, Berlin's become very, very popular as well. There's, there's a ton of incentives there. There's a ton of startups. It's incredibly cheap. We, uh, yeah, we looked at London. It was really expensive. So Berlin's looking pretty appealing. Um, US, uh, you should go where... Your customers are so if it's finance or if it's uh, media you should you should go to New York if it's tech um, you should go to California yeah just you just need to look at what works for you all those cities like Chicago Seattle LA they they all work and they're all trying to get people there there's even smaller ones like Boulder and um, Columbus that are really trying to rally people there uh, so yeah just whatever works for you okay Right, so this whole time while all this kind of stuff is going on, you're trying to get all this stuff right, there are most likely going to be people doing what you do who are already in that market. They have contacts, they speak the language, um, they're physically there. So they're going to have an edge on you. So try and look at a way so you go, okay, we're going to this market and there is this local competitor, but we're better because we can be cheaper because we scale all around the world. Or we've just got a better platform because of these features. Make sure you've got some kind of edge, otherwise people are naturally gonna choose the one that's right there that they can pick up the phone and see and have a coffee with and that kind of stuff. And that was something we definitely found tough with some of our competitors, in the U especially in the US. Um, okay. Yeah, so to recap in terms of the, I guess, uh, what, you should be, what you should be doing when you make this call, Work out, pick a market that you want to go into, um, get customers and do the marketing and test everything and make sure it's worth your while. Then do the, do the new language or do the um, localization that's required to get your product just there, like the minimum version doesn't have to be fancy. Um, make sure you can operate, make sure you can charge people, uh, <clears throat> make sure you've got a way to kind of be in that time zone and handle the customer support and actually look after your clients. And then um, have an edge and make sure you stand out from those uh, local competitors. And these are the things at um, the startups my friends run and that I've seen and also at ours that have really helped us kind of following this process. Uh, there's literally tons of stuff I've skipped over that I could talk about, like different cultural things to be aware of in different markets. Um, example with the billing one, there's services like Stripe and Braintree where you can literally plug them into your website and you can charge in all these different currencies. Um, there's tons of stuff we could go into. I guess I was only trying to go over the, um, the core stuff so we could really jump into the Q&A and, and, and find some of the kind of uh, problems or key focus areas that people in the room really want to uh, dive into. So, um, cool.